Order it. Being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted. The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And with the indulgence of the House, I would like to mark the award to Australia's newest Nobel laureate, Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, I was able to meet with Professor Schmidt and uh, convey our congratulations to him. Uh, Mr Speaker, even though I had a direct discussion with him, I am not going to pretend I am in a position to describe to the House the nature of his discovery in astrophysics. It is not very often that you are looking for words of congratulations for someone who has uh, literally uh, redefined our understanding of our universe, but that is exactly what Professor Schmidt has achieved. This is a fantastic personal award for him, but when I met with him, the thing he wanted me to most understand was he viewed it as an award for the team of researchers that he worked with. He is very proud of the work that he does. He's very proud of the team of researchers that he works with, and he has many uh, friends at the Australian Australian National University who were able to celebrate this award with him. So our congratulations go to him for a remarkable achievement. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I rise to join the Prime Minister in welcoming Australia's 12th Nobel Prize and the 6th uh, for the Australian National University uh, and in congratulating Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, Mr Speaker, in a stellar career, uh, the Nobel Prize is the ultimate accolade. Uh, although uh, Professor Schmidt was born in the United States, he's built his career here in Australia, and remarkably, Mr Speaker, uh, he says that he might not have been able to succeed uh, in the way he has uh, had he been anywhere else in the world. Uh, so, uh, Mr Speaker, this is obviously a great moment for our country. It's a great moment for his university and for Australian science, and it is proof if anyone needed, that the brain drain is not all the wrong way. The Leader of the House. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I ask leave of the House to refer further, further statements on indulgence on Brian Smith, Nobel Prize winner for physics, to the main committee. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that further statements on indulgence on Brian Smith, Nobel Prize winner for physics, be referred to the main committee. Order. The question is that further statements on indulgence on Brian Schmidt, Nobel Prize winner for physics, be referred to the main committee. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Before calling on questions, I've got to say that I notice that there is a fair degree of background noise already in question time. Um, I think that that indicates that you're talking quietly amongst yourselves, but you're all talking quietly at the same time. So, questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the member for M Morton, who said he would resign rather than back a leadership change, saying, and I quote, I will not be breaking faith with the people of Morton. I did it in 2010, and I've been constantly reminded that I did. This is about me keeping faith with the people who put me in office. So I ask the Prime Minister, will she and Labor members of this House now keep faith with the Australian people by honouring her pre-election commitment that, and I quote, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? Order. 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 Question has been asked. The Prime Minister now has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And what a remarkable question from a Leader of the Opposition who is on the public record as supporting a carbon tax, who is on the public record as supporting a carbon price, who has said consistently only one thing to the Australian people. The only thing he believes in is what he thinks the politics of the moment is telling him. That's the only thing he believes in. 
uh, historically and famously referred to by the member for Wentworth as a weather vane, someone who's got no core beliefs about Australia's future, no ability to shape that future, no concern about jobs in the future, no concern for pensioners or for family payments in the future, no concern for cutting taxes. Mr Speaker, today and tomorrow particularly, this House of Representatives will vote on putting a price on carbon. This, vote, this House of Representatives will record its vote on whether we believe climate change is real, on whether we believe that the most efficient way of addressing climate change is to put a price on carbon pollution, on whether we believe in protecting Australian jobs on whether we believe that pensioners and people who are raising families deserve extra assistance, on whether we believe we should be providing tax cuts to working people earning less than $80,000 a year, and particularly the biggest tax cuts to people on lower incomes. These will be the things that go for a vote tomorrow. And what I can say to the Leader of the Opposition is each and every step of the way he has found a way to twist and turn in this debate. He used to be in favour of pricing carbon, now Order. he says the he's opposed. But I can understand the, the Leader of the Stur. Opposition here today advocating further delay in putting a price on carbon. I can understand that because the Leader of the Opposition senses what the Australian people will ultimately come to know, that his so-called promise to repeal a price on carbon is just nonsense. He won't repeal a price on carbon if he is ever elected as Prime Minister. He won't do that because more than half of his political party Order. supports putting a price on carbon. He won't do that because to do that would mean repudiating every living Liberal leader. He won't do that because ultimately wiser heads will prevail in the opposition and they will say, don't take money out of the hands of pensioners. Don't take money out of the hands of families. He won't do that and he isn't to be believed when he says it will, he will. Tomorrow this House will record its vote and every member will be required to file in here and to record whether they are on the side of history, whether they are on the side of action, whether they are on the side of change or whether they were content to stand against and watch the world change while Australia stayed the same. Well, we on this side of the parliament will vote for a clean energy future, for reducing carbon pollution, for enabling economic growth without increases in carbon pollution, for putting more money in the hands of pensioners, working Australians who need it the most, people raising families and making sure, more importantly than almost anything else, we seize the jobs and opportunities that come with a clean energy future. Yeah. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. On a supplementary to the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, in the light of the Prime Minister's answer a moment ago, why did she say five days before the last election, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. And in the light of what she's just said, if the arguments in favour of a carbon tax are so good, why won't she have the courage Order. of her convictions and put this to the people at an election? Order. Order. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I look forward to the Leader of the Opposition's uh, explanation as to why he said in the past that he's in favour of putting a tax on carbon, why he said in the past that he's in favour of putting a price on Order. carbon, why he Order. said in the past that, quote unquote, he's a bit of a weather vane when asked. it comes to this, a man of no core convictions, the no promises, stirred. nothing that can be believed, and certainly one thing that can never be believed is his assertion that he will repeal this price on carbon. The Leader of the Opposition won't do that. To the Leader of the Opposition's question, as I have said many times before, in this parliament and beyond, as I've spoken to members of the community, I have talked to them about how the science is real. I accept the science. Frequently, the Leader of the Opposition does not that we need to cut carbon pollution by 5 per cent at least by 2020. I believe in doing that. Some days the Leader of the Opposition does not. 
I believe we should accept the advice of economists that the most cost-effective way of doing that is to put a price on carbon. The Leader of the Opposition never accepts, accepts advice from economists. Instead, he personally criticises them. That I believe that as we price carbon and reduce carbon pollution, we should do everything we can to provide benefits to pensioners, to people raising children, to workers deserving a tax cuts, and we will. That we should do everything we can to support the steel industry, and we will. And tomorrow's vote, in part, will be about who stands alongside steel workers and who is prepared to desert them. That will be what tomorrow's vote is about as well. As the Leader of the Opposition well knows, in the last election campaign I spoke to the Australian people about the science being real. I spoke to the Australian people about the need to have an emissions trading scheme. We have used the opportunity of this parliament. This parliament will deliver this major reform, which will enable us to seize a clean energy future. Meanwhile, I anticipate the Leader of the Opposition, the man who used to be in favour of pricing carbon, the man who used to talk favourably about putting a tax on carbon, the man who has said he is nothing but a weather vane when it comes to this huge issue for the nation's future. I anticipate that the Leader of the Opposition will start twisting and turning and becoming sharper and more hysterical in a desperate attempt to try and convince the Australian people he will repeal carbon pricing. We know he won't. Order. Before calling the member for Karangamite, I inform the House we have present in the gallery this afternoon members of the Australian Political Exchange Council's 28th delegation from the United States of America. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The member for Karangamite. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is the, the government undertaking reforms to create a clean energy future and make sure that, despite the patchwork economy, no Australian is left behind? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, well, I and I thank the for member North for Karangamide about his question, because the thing that is at the centre of his question is jobs, jobs for Australian uh, the Australian people, jobs for working Australians. And I can understand why the opposition greeted it with scoffing, because they don't care about jobs. Mr Speaker, in the days since this parliament last met, the government has announced its intention to have an Asian century white paper. Almost every Australian would be able to give you chapter and verse about the resources boom, about the boom in mining. Many Australians are either participating in it, in it themselves, live in a, a community that is affected by the growth in mining, or have a family member who is affected by the growth in mining. People understand that there is a resources boom, and that is a good thing. That is a great thing for our country because it means jobs and opportunity and prosperity, with more than $400 billion of investment in the pipeline. But at the same time, many Australians say to themselves, well, that's fantastic that there is such a record pricing for the things that we've got to sell. But what happens? What happens in the days beyond the resources boom, in the days where we fully export, exploited our mineral wealth, when we have extracted it, when we have exported it? What happens in those days? What will people do for a job then? What will those Australians do for jobs then? What will their children do? This is a question on the minds of Australians as they contemplate the future. The Asian Century White Paper will be about speaking to Australians about the opportunities that come from growth in our region, and those opportunities are more than the opportunities from the resources boom. They are about the spectacular development of the middle classes in Asia, growth of 1.2 billion people in the Asian middle class by 2020, people who will want to buy our food, want to buy our wine, want to come here on holidays, want legal services, accounting services international education, opportunities right across the Australian economy. But we face a challenge, and the challenge is, in these days of the resources boom, as the Australian dollar is high and sustained, how to make sure that industries feeling the pressure of that high sustained Australian dollar also maintain their competitiveness during these days. 
and that is why we focused on the Future Jobs Forum, on working with those industries during the days of the patchwork economy, because I want to see us sustain economic diversity during these days and in the days beyond the resources boom. I want to see us come out with a more diversified economy rather than a less diversified economy. That is what the Future Jobs Forum was about. And interestingly, Mr Speaker, the tax forum was also about those questions of the patchwork economy. They were centrally before the tax forum in the reform propositions that people work through. Mr Speaker, we are determined to seize this future. It is about the mineral resource rent tax, so we can take tax from the uh, turbocharged section of the economy and use it to support businesses elsewhere. It is about the NBN and the benefits of a high technology future. It is about responding to the demands of a patchwork economy and making sure we're doing what we can to support Australian industry. And it is too about seizing a clean energy future. We cannot be left behind. We cannot be left behind as the world seizes clean energy jobs. Mr Speaker, we don't intend to have Australia left behind. We will fully seize the opportunities that come from this future. Yeah. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer the Foreign Minister to his recent trips to Japan, the United Arab Emirates, Kazakhstan, Bahrain, Brazil, the Republic of Korea, Mexico, Indonesia, <laughs> Papua New Guinea, Thailand, Israel, Vietnam and the United States, amongst many others, over the last year. Can the Foreign Order. Minister confirm that not one of these countries has an economy-wide carbon tax? Order. Order the House will come to order. 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 The Minister for Foreign Affairs. I uh, welcome very much the uh, question from the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. Although we do wonder how much longer the Leader of the Opposition has confidence in the uh, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, given his statement the other day about the good old member for Kuyong when he said, it's nice to have someone in the parliamentary party who understands foreign affairs at last. Now, Julie, that is a ringing vote of endorsement, if ever I had one. And Josh, just remain calm. Order. Mr Speaker. Order that. No. The, the, the minister resume his seat until the... The minister will resume his seat until the House comes to order. 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 The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I also appreciate very much the um, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs a discovery of the fact that, as Foreign Minister of Australia, I do travel abroad. Um, and as I've said in various fora around Australia when asked this, the universal conclusion of foreign ministers around the world is that most foreigners do live abroad. That is why we travel abroad to meet those foreigners. And I thank very much, I thank very much. I thank very much the uh, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs Order. for drawing that basic fact to our attention. My own view, the my own view, um, and member. I share this very much with the member for Curtin, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, is that there comes a stage when point scoring over the cost of overseas travel by political figures demeans our national self-respect. They protest. The members they protest, for North Mr. Sydney. Speaker. The author and of those Dixon. remarks was John Winston Howard uh, in his most recent book, Lazarus Rising. And I think that actually goes to the maturity which is lacked in this place on the part of those opposite when it comes to the necessity of either a Prime Minister or Foreign Minister travelling abroad in Australia's national interests. Furthermore, could I say, could I say to uh, the, uh, Order, the Member for McCullough. 
Can I also say to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, and can I say also to the Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, that the when it comes to global action, the uh, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs should contemplate a few basic facts. She should contemplate the facts that we have around the world at present a large number of economies which have already introduced or are in the process of introducing emissions trading schemes. We also have evidence around the world that in terms of, for example, the People's Republic of China or India, we see actions of a type we have not seen in previous decades. China in 2009 adding 37 gigawatts of renewable power capacity, more than any other country of the world. India has introduced a tax on coal, which is expected to generate funds for further re research into clean energies. The UK, run by the Tories, Order. has set an ambitious plan to halve its carbon exports Order. and carbon emissions by 2027. And, Mr Speaker, the Republic of Korea has a 2020 emissions reduction pledge to reduce emissions by 20 per cent below business as usual, not to mention Japan, a target to improve its energy efficiency by 30 per cent by 2030. What does all this indicate, Mr Speaker? It says that there are governments and political parties around the world who recognise the future, the need to act on climate change and to put a price on carbon, and there are those who keep their heads stuck firmly in the ground and who refuse to do so. We are acting for this nation's future. You are denying this nation a future. Order. Order. The member for Cook on a point of order. I would just ask, I would just ask could the Minister for Foreign Affairs table the section of Lazarus Rising from which he's been reading? So don't encourage the member for New England. If I was marking homework, that's very close. But, and I say to the member for Cook, I will ignore it on this time, but he should be very careful. He's got form on those sort of things. The member for Robertson. No black caviar. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the importance to our economy of putting a price on carbon pollution? What would be the consequence of failing to charge the biggest polluters? The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Robertson for what is a very important question because tomorrow in this House, we will vote on one of the most important economic reforms in a generation, Mr Speaker. And it is going to be a test for each and every one of us in this House tomorrow, Mr Speaker, because are we going to face up to the climate science and doing something about carbon pollution? Are we going to face up to the fact that we should not leave for our children and our grandchildren greater costs and the heavy burden of carbon pollution? Mr. Speaker, and are we going to show to the Australian people and subsequent generations that we had the guts to face up to the tough economic reforms that will deliver prosperity for future generations, Mr. Speaker? And for us on this side of the House, we are going to act on all of those challenges because we understand that in the 21st century, to be a first class economy, you must be powered by clean energy. And that is why it is so important that we do put a price on every tonne of carbon pollution emitted by the biggest polluters. We understand on this side of the House that we need to send a price signal to drive the investment in clean energy and in renewable energy. And we understand the importance of that in the 21st century if we want to continue to be a strong economy. One of the reasons why Australia is so strong 
One of the reasons why the International Monetary Fund gives our economy such a big tick is that governments in the past, over the past 25 to 30 years, have had the guts to face up to the big economic reforms. That is why we are strong now. That is why we are resilient now, because governments took the long-term view. And the long-term view is the one that is right for our country. It may not be the most immediately politically popular course of action, but it is right for our country. And that is why we on this side of the House will be supporting a clean energy future tomorrow when those critical votes come through. And those on the opposite side of the House will be saying no, as they constantly say no, turning their back on the future, turning their back on their children and their grandchildren, turning their back on future economic prosperity. Mr. Speaker. All of the modelling shows that our economy can grow strongly with a price on carbon, that income can, incomes can grow strongly, putting a price on carbon pollution. And we also know what they'll do as well. They will rip away the essential tax reforms that we are putting in place, essential reforms which will see another one million people take it out of the tax system because we're going to triple the tax-free threshold. They will take the claw out and claw that back. Mr. Speaker, and what they will also do is claw back the pension increases. Mr. Speaker, they will claw it back because they don't have a positive approach to the future. They want to turn their back on the future, rip away that assistance, and ignore what must be done. What must be done to grow our economy, to grow jobs, and to ensure future prosperity. They only know one course of action. That is to say no to wreck and turn their back on the future. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to concerns in financial markets about the risk of a sovereign debt default in Europe, the weak growth outcomes recorded in the United States, Japan, and many European countries, and the IMF's downgrade of the growth forecast for Europe and the United States, stating that, and I quote, the global economy is in a dangerous new phase. I ask the Treasurer, isn't this the worst possible time to introduce the world's biggest carbon tax that will slow economic growth in Australia, increase inflation in Australia and cost Australian jobs? Here, here. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I do thank the Shadow Treasurer for his question. And whilst it is true there is uncertainty, it is also true there is volatility in the global economy. It is also true that the Australian economy remains relatively strong, Mr Speaker. And he quoted a number of authorities before. Indeed, he quoted the International Monetary Fund. Well, the International Monetary Fund has been to Australia. They've produced their, what's called their Article 4 report. It's come out in the last couple of weeks in full. You know what it does in that report? It gives a big tick to cut carbon oh, pricing, Mr. North Speaker. Sydney has the very report that he quotes to seek to say that we should defer carbon pricing is the one that gives it a very big tick. A comprehensive report on the Australian economy, but he didn't read the report, Mr. Speaker. He's just that sloppy all of the time. The Order. fact is that the IMF Order. has given carbon pricing in Australia a big tick. Indeed, as they have given the government's economic management a very big tick. Now, what I need to do now is to quote from that report. It's only a couple of weeks old because what it says is this. Australia's performance since the onset of the global financial crisis has been enviable. That's what it says. That is, it says the Australian economy is strong. It says the Australian economy is in good shape. And it says it's strong and in good shape for a couple of reasons. First of all, it says what a good oh. job this government did Order. during the global financial crisis to support our economy and avoid going into recession. And then it points to the fact that over the years, fundamental economic reforms have been implemented by governments from both sides of politics to strengthen our economy. So they go back. They talk about the big, the, the big reforms of the past, IMF report after IMF report, the floating of the dollar, the bringing down of the tariff wall, national competition policy national superannuation, all the big reforms that have strengthened our economy. And it is in that context that the International Monetary Fund supports putting an overall price on carbon. 
so the height of the shadow treasurer to come in this House and quote the International Monetary Fund, which is giving the government's economic policies a big tick and which supports carbon pricing. Now, this is just so, so typical of those opposite. They are so negative. They've got their heads stuck so far in the sand they can't see the wood Order. for the trees. Order. Mr Speaker, these people, these people, these people are completely and utterly incompetent. Order, order. Order. The member for Dixon. The member for Sturt. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Climate Change. I refer to the government's changes to fuel tax credits as a part of the carbon tax, and I ask: Is the government aware that tens of thousands of businesses in Australia, many of them which, of which are small businesses, will be paying the effective carbon price? And does the government admit the, that this effective carbon price on fuel is not just a tax on big polluters? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for O'Connor for his question. And of course, uh, the House will consider further later today the government's clean energy uh, legislative package was a, is an extremely important reform for this country. And of course, he's referred to the carbon pricing mechanism uh, in his question. And of course, it's around 500 of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases that will carry a liability under the, under the carbon price mechanism, there are, in relation to off-road fuel, some forms of off-road fuel usage, of course, uh, arrangements that the legislation will put in place to apply an effective carbon price to them. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm aware of the fact, of course, that the member for O'Connor, I think, has uh, placed forward an amendment uh, this morning that relates to this issue, and I'd like to assure him that the government is looking very carefully at it. We understand the uh, concerns that he is raising and uh, recognise, of course, that he's representing the concerns that would have been raised with him uh, by people within his electorate. Um, I'm working, as I said, in my office and seeking some advice about the implications of the amendment that has been put forward. And, of course, I'd note uh, in this context, I think it's important to always bear in mind that in relation to the effective carbon pricing arrangements that the government is proposing to apply to various areas of off-road fuel usage, of course it is always important to bear in mind that there will be no effective carbon price applied in relation to light commercial vehicles so that Australian motorists will not be facing an effective carbon price in relation to their fuel usage. Uh, we'll have a look at the proposed amendment and have some further discussions with uh, the member for O'Connor about those particular issues, but it's also important just to conclude on this note that in rural and regional Australia, the exemptions in relation to off-road uh, usage that apply uh, to the agriculture, forestry and fishing sectors are also very important considerations. But we'll have a look at the issues that the member has raised and have further discussions with him in relation to them. The member for Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, will the Minister update the House on the Government's clean energy future reforms? Why is the passage of this legislation critical for the Australian economy and our environment? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, member for Wills for his question. And Mr Speaker, as the House is aware, this morning the uh, second reading debate uh, resumed on the government's clean energy legislation package. As I said a moment ago, this is a very important environmental and economic reform uh, for this country. This evening, of course, we expect uh, to be able to proceed into the consideration in detail stage uh, in relation to the bills before a final vote tomorrow morning on both the clean energy bills and, of course, uh, another bill that is before the House, the government's steel transformation plan. Now, Mr Speaker, this is a crucial economic reform. It is central to assuring this country's economic prosperity and competitiveness in the years ahead. The Clean Energy Future Package will deliver 
very significant benefits to the economy over time, including a very significant increase in investment in clean energy. Now, the Treasury modelling that the Treasurer referred to a short while ago predicts, in fact, that the carbon price will drive around $100 billion, $100 billion of investment in the renewable energy sector over the period to 2050, and it will transform our energy sector and create a considerable number of jobs. And those jobs won't be just in new industries, in renewable technologies, but they will also support jobs in what we'd describe as the more traditional areas of the economy, including in construction, in electrical services and many areas of manufacturing. And in fact, the modelling shows that employment will increase in our economy by 1.6 million jobs to the year 2020. Now, Mr Speaker, at the same time, of course, the scheme that the government will introduce will be environmentally effective and the carbon price arrangements will see emissions reduced in our economy by at least 160 million tonnes in the year 2020 and ongoing. That is the least, the least reduction in emissions that we can expect from the arrangements to be put in place. Time and time again, Mr Speaker, in our history, in our economic history, it is the Labor Party that has made the reforms that are so crucial to future prosperity and intergenerational equity. And time and time again, it's the coalition that sided with vested interests against the interests of the nation and the Australian people generally. And let's not forget the fact that they opposed Medicare, they opposed compulsory superannuation, and now they are opposing this reform. Medicare, compulsory superannuation and this reform all promote intergener intergenerational equity. They will promote social equity. They will improve the environment. They are institutional changes that have ensured our economy remains competitive. And Mr Speaker, we've heard earlier in question time too, of course, that the Leader of the Opposition proposes to oppose the Steel Transformation Plan. And of course, this is after he's been running around trying to terrify people about their jobs in the industry. Once again, hypocrisy. Mr Speaker, this package that is before the House, this package that is before the House will be environmentally effective. It will be economically efficient and it will be socially equitable. The household assistance that the government is providing will ensure that nine out of ten households receive assistance through either the tax reform and the tax cuts that will be implemented or the increase in Commonwealth benefits, a 1.7 per cent increase in the pension, nine out of ten households will receive this assistance and it will be a very important and equitable reform for the nation. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to the Treasurer's claim that the carbon tax will have a, quote, modest impact on prices. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this increase will add to the cost of electricity, gas and water bills that have risen 43.9 per cent since Labor came to power, and the price of fruit and vegetables that have risen 35.4 per cent? I ask the Prime Minister, is this really the right time to introduce a trillion dollar carbon tax that will increase the cost of everything? Order. 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 Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and it's clear that the campaign of deceit continues. Uh, that, question, uh, that question has been uh, put together in order to pretend to the Australian people that price rises in things like electricity are somehow associated with the actions of this government. The member is better than that. The member knows that is untrue, and he should not come into this parliament and pretend that it is true. Completely untrue, Casey. completely false, calculated to create a climate of fear, completely disrespectful to the people of Australia. As the member knows, if he is seriously concerned about questions like rises in electricity pricing and in water pricing, he may want to have a discussion uh, with his state yeah. colleagues, particularly Premier the Bayou, who is on the record as supporting a Casey. price on carbon. 
on the record as supporting a price on carbon. Now, I understand, Mr Speaker, that because of a set of questions relating to investment in infrastructure particularly, that electricity prices have been rising. They have been rising under Premier Bailey. They have been rising under Premier Barnett in Western Australia. At least Premier Barnett has had the honesty the honesty to go out to the Western Australian people and explain how the price rises are associated with the need for investment in infrastructure in Western Australia. That is, that the price rises are there because of a set of reasons Order. associated with state governments. And the same, of course, is true with water infrastructure, including investments that are being made in new capacity. Uh, so no one should uh, fall for the uh, misleading attempt that the member has engaged in it is completely disrespectful to the Australian people. On the question of the price impacts on carbon, despite of carbon pricing, despite these many, many months of fear and smear and absolutely running away from the facts, despite the Leader of the Opposition each and every day going out there and saying to the Australian people things that are untrue. Uh, what the member knows, and every member of this member parliament knows, is, is that the uh, flow-through price impact of asking the biggest polluters in our country to pay the price of their carbon pollution uh, to Australians is less than 1 per cent of CPI—0.7 per cent of CPI. And it is as a result of that uh, flow through price change, less than 1 per cent of CPI, less than a cent in a dollar, that the government has determined it is appropriate to use uh, more than half of the revenue generated by carbon pricing to help pensioners who will receive an increase of $338, to help people raising children with an increase in family payments, uh, to help Solomon. Australians earning less than $80,000 a year with a tax cut and to associate that tax change with a major tax reform, which will mean a million Australians will not be in the tax system, not pay any tax and see better each and every week the rewards for working. Now, I'd say to the member who asked the question who, in other iterations of his political life, has been prepared to contemplate reforms, including reforms like carbon pricing, perhaps instead of following the leader of the opposition's fear campaign, he should listen to a former Liberal leader, and I'm referring to Dr John Hewson, who has appeared in this book, former employer of the leader of the opposition. That was a bad decision, but he's made one good one. He says, I say yes to carbon pricing because this is the most important thing we can do for our nation this century. A former Liberal leader joining every other living Liberal Order. leader in favour of carbon Order. pricing, all except the wrecker over here. Order. Order. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families housing, community services and Indigenous affairs. Minister, will you update the House on how the government is supporting Australian families and pensioners in our plan to put a price on carbon pollution? What would be the impact of failing to provide this support? The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Shortland for her question. Uh, she knows that this government is determined to act in the national interest to introduce a price on carbon pollution. She also knows that this government is determined to make sure that uh, it's the big polluters that pay for carbon pollution and not Australian families and pensioners. We want to make sure that acting on climate change continues to be in the interests of the economy and in the interests of our children. Of course, under our plan to put a price on carbon pollution, we do intend to provide support to pensioners. 3.4 million pensioners will receive assistance, assistance that amounts to $338 for single pensioners each year and $255 a year for each mem member of a pensioner couple. And very importantly for pensioners, of course, through both the pension and the clean energy supplement, 
they will increase over time to make sure that the assistance that we do provide to pensioners will keep up with the cost of living. It's also the case that under our uh, plan to put a price on carbon pollution, we intend to uh, provide support to nine out of ten households. Nine out of ten households will receive support, and of course, very importantly, that will include three million low-income households who will uh, receive assistance over and above their expected increase in prices. So all of these, uh, all of these increases in payments and pensions will be very important for all of those Australians. It will also be the case that these increases in payments will go straight into the uh, uh, bank accounts of uh, families and uh, straight into the bank accounts of pensioners no extra forms or queues for people to worry about. Now, of course, what we know is the Leader of the Opposition has a very different plan to this, a very different plan. What he intends to do is act in his own interest, not in the nation's interest. What this Leader of the Opposition is going to do is make sure that uh, he uh, gives, the bill, gives the bill for dealing with carbon pollution to families gives the bill to pensioners, and we know that that will amount to uh, Australian families being $1,300 a year worse off as a result of his changes. Even worse, uh, even worse uh, Mr Speaker, what we know is that this Leader of the Opposition the intends to claw back claw back the assistance that this government will provide to pensioners and to families. And I hear the member for Herbert up there making uh, a right royal noise about uh, the clawback that this uh, Leader of the Opposition is going to do. And that will mean 17,400 pensioners in Herbert will have their assistance clawed back. The party of fight back is now the party of clawback. The order, order. The leader of the opposition. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer her to global economic uncertainty, dwindling consumer confidence, the higher cost of living faced by Australia's forgotten families, and widespread job insecurity. All of which will be made worse by the government's toxic carbon cap tax. And I ask. With the government increasingly paralysed by disunity over leadership, why should the Australian people have any confidence that the Prime Minister is protecting their jobs rather than her own? Prime Minister. Uh, thank Order. you very much, Mr Speaker. And the kind of question we often get, often get from the Leader of the Opposition, it's always you know, heavy on the drama. What it's never got in it is any facts, and what we never hear is any alternatives that make any sense. The Leader of the Opposition never campaigns on his so-called direct action Order. plan, a plan to subsidise polluters, because he knows it won't work and it doesn't add up. And the Leader of the Opposition is here today with all of this dramatic carry-on because he knows once a carbon price is legislated and commences to operate, then the fear campaigns he has been engaged in will be exposed as absolute nonsense. And he knows that he won't ever repeal carbon pricing. He will go round, running round like a headless chook in hyperactive mode, trying to pretend to everybody that he will. But he knows this that significant figures in the Liberal Party support putting a price on carbon. Every living Liberal leader except this Leader of the Opposition. He knows, he knows that once it is in place that money will start to flow to pensioners and to families and providing workers with tax cuts. He knows that in the past he has been incredibly in favour of putting a price on carbon and so his uh, rhetoric about repealing the carbon price will be 
be seen through by the Australian people. Now, the Leader of the Opposition has the temerity to come in here and talk about jobs. Well, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, in the carbon pricing package, we are providing literally billions of dollars to work with Australian industry to support Australian jobs. We will be there working with Australian industry to support those jobs in manufacturing, in steel, as well as seizing the clean energy opportunities of the future and the jobs that come with it. The Leader of the Opposition, who has been in and out of factories trying to associate himself with working people, the same working people he ran a mile from during the days of work choices, is now saying to those steel workers that he stood alongside, I could help your industry by voting for a $300 million steel transformation plan, but I won't do it. The politics is more important to me than supporting your job. We in the votes today and tomorrow will be supporting the jobs of steel workers. The Leader of the Opposition will sit in that chair and vote against their jobs. Vote against their jobs. And Mr Speaker, on the question of jobs, last week we had a future jobs forum. The input of the opposition, well, apart from cutting assistance to the automobile industry, apart from having no plan for skills except cutbacks to apprenticeship, apart from having no plan for the economy except desperately trying to cover up their planned $70 billion of cuts to services, what does the opposition stand for? Well, it certainly isn't jobs, Mr Speaker. It's certainly isn't jobs. No plans for the jobs of Australians at all, and they are bored by the discussion of it. Mr Speaker, every time we have talked about carbon pricing in this country, figures in the opposition have thought up a new reason to delay. Well, history is marching on. We are going to get this done, Mr Speaker. This House of Representatives is going to get this done tomorrow. We will be there voting on the side of history. The Leader of the Opposition will be writing his name into history as the biggest wrecker to ever serve in a leadership role in Australian politics. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. 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 The Leader of the Opposition. So you'll have the courage Mr to Speaker, I, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended Order. as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion forthwith, that this House calls on the Prime Minister to explain to the Australian people the following. First, why this is the right time to introduce the world's largest carbon tax despite growing economic uncertainty, and second, why, why it is right for the Prime Minister to break her solemn pledge that there would be no carbon tax under a government I lead by bringing in this tax without the consent of the Australian people. Well, Mr Speaker, standing orders must be suspended because that is the only way to make the Prime Minister face up to the folly and the deception of her carbon tax. Mr Speaker, the only way we can make this Prime Minister front the Australian people and the Australian Parliament is by suspending standing orders. And Mr Speaker, still, still, this Prime Minister scurries out of this chamber. Disgraceful behaviour by this Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who refuses to answer questions in this parliament and now refuses to face up to a suspension motion in this parliament. Mr Speaker, no previous Prime Minister would behave in such a graceless and unparliamentary way. Now, Mr Speaker, let me say this. There is never a good time to introduce a bad tax, but this is the worst possible time. Uh, confidence in our own country is at rock-bottom record lows. Unemployment is edging up. The euro is under great pressure, and countries in Europe face the risk of sovereign debt default. There is the threat of a worldwide recession, and what is the response of this government to clobber the Australian economy with a carbon tax? Mr Speaker, the forgotten families of Australia are doing it tougher and tougher. Cost of living pressures has almo have almost never been worse. Power up 51 per cent since December 2007. 
water up 46 per cent since December 2007, uh, gas up 30 per cent, health costs up 20 per cent, education costs up 24 per cent, rent up 21 per cent, fruit and veggies Mr. Speaker, up 35 per cent since de December 2007. The average mortgage holder is paying $500 a month more now than 18 months ago. And what is the response of this government? They want to make a bad situation worse by clobbering the Australian people with the world's biggest carbon tax. And it just goes up and up and up. That's why we need standing orders suspended to make the Prime Minister to face up to what she is doing to the Australian people. $23 a tonne next year, $29 a tonne in 2020. $131 a tonne, Mr. Speaker, on the government's own figures. On the government's own figures uh, in 2050. And, Mr. Speaker, if you look at the government's own figures, the gross national income per head of Australians will be $5,000 a year less under a carbon tax than it would be without a carbon tax. That's $5,000 in lost income for every Australian, $5,000 out of every Australian's pockets because of this government and the act of economic self-harm, which is constituted by its carbon tax. And, Mr Speaker, we hear the Prime Minister talk about compensation. Well, even on the government's own figures, some three million Australian households will be worse off under this carbon tax. And, Mr Speaker, we all know what this government would be like. We all know what this government would be like. The compensation would be temporary, but the tax would be permanent, because we know that this government is absolutely addicted to spending and taxing and borrowing. Mr Speaker, in 2050, our gross domestic product will be $100 billion a year less with a carbon tax than it would be without a carbon tax. Between now and 2050, our economy will be $1 trillion worse off. That's $1 trillion in wealth that our economy won't have between now and 2050 because of this government and its carbon tax. Every single Australian will lose $40,000 between now and 2050 because of this government's carbon tax. It's as if every single one of us was asked to work for a whole year for nothing. For nothing. That is the wealth destruction inherent in this government's carbon tax. And Mr Speaker, for what? For what? They say they are reducing emissions by 5 per cent by 2020. Wrong. That's not what their carbon tax is doing. Their carbon tax is raising emissions by 8 per cent, from 578 million tonnes now to 621 million tonnes on their own figures. Uh, they only reduce uh, emissions by 160 million tonnes by shovelling $3.5 billion abroad, uh, buying more than 100 million tonnes of carbon credits from the foreign carbon traders. And that minister uh, sitting on the front benches should have the honesty to own up. He should have the honesty to own up to the fact that we aren't reducing our emissions by 80 per cent by 2050. On his own figures, we are reducing our emissions by 6 per cent by 6 per cent from 578 million tonnes to 445 million tonnes. We only achieve uh, the reduction in emissions by shovelling $57 billion, or 1.5 per cent of Australia's GDP, to the foreign carbon traders, the greatest transfer of wealth overseas in this country's history. But, Mr right. Speaker, this is a bad tax based on a lie. It's a bad tax based on a lie. Does anyone in this House remember the Prime Minister standing up in this chamber just a few years ago and proudly boasting, the Labor Party is the party of truth-telling? <laughs> Do they remember our Prime Minister saying that? Uh, does anyone remember the Prime Minister saying uh, in the campaign of last year 
What I say in this campaign is what I will do. Well, she said it, and I tell you what else she said. She said there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. That's what she said. Uh, that is the phrase that will haunt this Prime Minister and this government to its political death. Uh, this is the phrase that the Prime Minister just cannot face. Uh, like Dracula uh, and the clove of garlic, this is the phrase that this Prime Minister simply can't face up to. But, Mr Speaker, it was very interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was reading uh, the Sydney Morning Herald this morning and I came, aco I came across a man of honour. One man of honour. One man of honour, and this is why standing orders should be suspended, so that the one man of honour uh, opposite can listen to his Prime Minister demonstrate that she's not a person of honour. I will not be breaking faith with the people of Morton. I did it in 2010, and I've been constantly reminded by my, vo by my voters that I did that. The member for Morton went on. People need to grow a bit of backbone and give the Australian people a chance to embrace and understand our policies. Well, I tell you what, Mr Speaker, the Australian people well understood the policies that this Prime Minister took to the election. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. I tell you who should grow a bit of backbone. It's this Prime Minister. She should grow a bit of backbone. Grow a bit of backbone and stand up to Bob Brown and the Greens, who are running this government's uh, agenda. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I say to members opposite, I say in particular to the member for Morton, why is he prepared to keep faith with the Australian people in a way that benefits the Prime Minister and saves her job and not keep faith? with the electorate in a way that benefits them and saves their job by voting against this carbon tax, this toxic carbon tax that will be so bad for the people of Morton. So I say to members opposite, you've got about 18 hours left to stand up for your electorates. Stand up for the coal mines and the coal miners of this country. Stand up for the steel mills and the steel workers of this country. Stand up for the manufacturing workers of this country and say no to this toxic tax. And if you think it makes sense, have the guts to have an election. If it really Order. makes sense, have Order. an election the members and have time it now. Has expired. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second the motion. Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended to give the Prime Minister the opportunity to come back into this House to explain to the Australian people why she believes her job security is more important than the job security of millions of workers across Australia. This suspension is necessary because the Prime Minister twists and turns every day in every question time and refuses to provide the Australian people with the answers to their concerns about this carbon tax. This suspension is necessary because the Prime Minister arrogantly dismisses concerns about the job security of others because she is so selfishly focused on her own job security. And who could blame the Foreign Minister for wanting to get his old job back? After all, it was this Prime Minister who convinced him to drop his carbon price scheme and then she used it against him to take his job off him. And revenge is a powerful motivator. Oh yes, revenge is a very powerful motivator. But this Prime Minister is running from accountability. She's refusing to acknowledge the concerns about the impact of the carbon tax and the dishonest way in which it's being foisted upon the Australian people. Mr Speaker, last week I visited a furn furniture manufacturer in Cowra, in the electorate of Hume, with the member for Hume. Here, here. And this story that I was told is being repeated in thousands and thousands of businesses across Australia. And that's why this suspension is necessary. This business was established 30 years ago. Its success based on the efforts and energy and commitment of a local family, taking a risk, building a business, creating jobs and opportunities for local people, currently employing 130 people and using Australian plantation timber to make furniture. The owner spoke so passionately about his commitment to quality and innovation and efficiency and how that has allowed him to compete successfully against imports from China. 
He told me about his constant drive for greater efficiency and waste reduction and his investment in capital, which has enabled him to reduce the carbon footprint in his business by more than 30 per cent in the last couple of years. This business has calculated what the future cost of electricity will be under this carbon tax. He's done the sums with his accountant, and this proud small business manufacturer believes the increases in costs because of this carbon tax will destroy his business, possibly within a couple of years of its introduction. He's not so concerned about his own welfare because he'll just retire, but that of the 130 employees who he said will struggle to find alternative work. And he is particularly angry that competitors in China won't be impacted by an economy-wide carbon tax. His business will receive no compensation under this government's carbon tax legislation, and this government gives him no recognition at all of his efforts to voluntarily reduce emissions from his business. Now, Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended to give the Prime Minister time to explain to this small business and the thousands and thousands like it across the country why manufacturers in this country should pay a carbon tax when its competitors overseas will not. This Prime Minister should explain to the 130 employees <coughs> of this cower of business and their families why their jobs are threatened in order to save the Prime Minister's job. Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended so the Prime Minister can explain why a carbon tax is being imposed at a time when economic storm clouds continue to gather in Europe. There's great uncertainty about the global economy. There's talk about a recession. Consumer and business confidence remains fragile in this country, and the Prime Minister must explain why she intends to further damage confidence by her insistence on a carbon tax. The latest Roy Morgan poll of consumer confidence shows it continues to fall. It's significantly lower than it was 12 months ago. Mr Speaker, this suspension is not only vital to give the Prime Minister an opportunity to explain why she broke a promise to the Australian people, it's an opportunity for every member of the Labor Party to consider their their position. The member for Morton said he'll quit the, if the Prime Minister is successfully challenged for the leadership. And he said, this is not about loyalty to Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd. It's about loyalty to the people of Morton. This is about me keeping faith with the people who put me in office. Well, I say to the member for Morton and I say to the members opposite, to keep faith with their electorates, they must honour the election promise the Prime Minister took to the last election when she uttered those infamous words, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. If the Labor members want to keep faith with the Australian people, they must hold her Order. to that promise, no Order. carbon the tax. Time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. If you want the House to go to call. why this suspension is being moved, you don't Order. have to the look at Sturt the clean energy the bills. No, you don't Sturt have to look at what legislation is before the parliament. You have to look at the TV guide. The TV guide. Because the TV guide shows that on ABC TV today at 3 p.m. Play School is Leader beginning. Leader of the House resume his place. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, given that the Prime Minister has failed, to, uh, has failed to front this very important suspension, I move that the Leader of the House be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All, of, all those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order. Order.
lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I point the honourable members for Barker and Parks, tell us for the ayes, and the members for Chifley and Shortland, tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 71, no 75. The question is therefore negatived. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that Order the Leader of the House. It's extraordinary that those opposite move a motion of suspension to allow a debate and then gag the debate. It says everything about their negativity, everything about what they're about on a day that we have clean energy legislation because, because we could get on with the business of the House that might allow the member for Wentworth to speak because we've had 120 speakers but he hasn't oh, spoken uh, because oh, he the agrees with us. The honourable time has expired. The, the question is, the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing and sessional orders 
be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank <laughs> you. Or to lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks tell us for the ayes, and the members for Chifley and Shortland tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 72, no 74. The question is therefore negative. Members, please resume their places quickly and quietly. Order.
Order the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In the absence of any questions on the nation's interest from the opposition, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. Order. Would members please either resume their places or, if they're leaving the chamber, do so quickly? Order. I present Corrigenda to the Auditor General's Annual Report for 2010-2011.